church. Good welcome and good morning and welcome to Bethany Baptist Church. Thank you for being here and submitting to our safety guidelines. I'm sorry we're out of masks. That's my fault. We'll have some more, uh, especially for our guests when they come. Uh, remind you to stay in your seat till the end until uh, Chuck dismisses you, uh, funeral style or wedding style. Uh, but our bathrooms are still open and available down the hallway. We've got a sanitation process for those um, if they're used. Um, if you can, please keep your mask on during the singing. That's when we're most vulnerable to sharing sickness if we have it. So keep your mask on if you can. And if you don't feel comfortable singing with a mask on, uh, the Lord knows the meditations of your heart so you can still think about the words and, and sing them um, to yourself. We know that God hears and knows our hearts. So one announcement I have for you, I'm very excited about. Next Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock, we're going to invite you back after worship at 2 o'clock. We're going to have a baptism service. Another one, our second of the year. Lord willing and with your uh, affirmation of approval, we will baptize uh, Haley Douglas. So uh, you all very excited. Together, a service to uh, to celebrate that moment and to encourage you in corporate worship and covenanting together as we uh, trust we're adding another uh, member to our church covenant member. So I'm very excited about that. Can't wait to share more of that with you and have her read her testimony and you all um, enjoy what God is doing and, and wants to make public in her life. So uh, that'll be next Sunday at two o'clock in our fellowship hall after our regular worship services. Um, so this morning, what you can expect, I'm gonna pray in just a moment for our country. Uh, we'll sing My Country Tis of Thee and How Deep the Father's Love, and we'll continue our uh, recent tradition of scripture reading. We've got someone special to read to us from God's Word. Uh, Chuck Goatee will lead us in congregational prayer for our missionaries and supporting them. Then we'll get our new family worship song of the month for July. Uh, then we'll have our sermon we'll end with a uh, song, I Lay My Sins on Jesus, and we will be dismissed uh, with a benediction from Galatians 3. Remind you, we're not going to pass the offering plates for safety during the service, but if you're a member um, and covenanting with us, I encourage you to give of your tithes and offerings and worship, but you'll have to wait and do that on your way out. The offering plates are out there, and our trustees will um, take care of that, um, but that'll be after the service. So. Be thinking about that, be preparing your hearts um, to worship in that way, and now through singing, um, hearing your God's word, and through prayer. So let's let's go to him in honor of this week's holiday. God asked the Jews asked in Romans what advantage. If any have they had, God, we acknowledge that you have given us great, much in every way, advantages that many other people and cultures do not have in this world now and throughout world history. So, God, we know that it is not of our own merit or goodness that you have put us in this country. But Lord, there are many advantages that we thank you for, the Father of lights, whom all good gifts come from. God, so we thank you for the land that we have, that we live in, that you have given to us for the time being. God, that is beautiful, whose soil produces food and crops and causes our hearts to praise you, Lord. So we thank you for this land that you have allowed us to live in. God, we thank you that it has, in times past and still for now, a land been a land of freedom of speech and freedom of religion. Lord, we know that not all countries have that and all governments allow that. But Lord, for the time being, we thank you for that advantage, that there would be the freedom to worship however we choose without the government suppressing or stopping us. So God, we thank you for that advantage that 
we can seek you freely this morning. God, we thank you for the freedom of the press and the ability to publish Bibles and to publish gospel tracts and Christian literature, Lord, so that we can know about you by these means and share the knowledge of you to others. God, you have been, you've been very kind. Lord, we were not, most of us, born in a country where the gospel has been rejected and where it is hated. Many of our parents have freely worshipped you and freely told us about you, God. It was not our goodness or our own choosing that put us here, but in your kindness you have made it possible that we could know you at an earlier age be saved. So we thank you for that. Lord, you did not owe it to us. We don't deserve it. So God, we thank you for these freedoms. We thank you for um, our leadership at times and our military that has um, helped at times to put down evil and the hold of rightness in the land and other countries and here. So we thank you for that, for those who serve to guard our freedom, to have laid down their lives for our freedoms. God, we thank you for this gift from your hand. So we praise you. But God, we still ask for help. We are an imperfect country. We have imperfect leadership. We respond imperfectly to all these graces and kindnesses. So God, as long as you foresee to maintain these kindnesses, God, would we be faithful to share the gospel, to exercise these freedoms, to share the gospel with our children, to speak to our neighbors, to worship you and not forsake the coming together of the saints. God, we pray for those in leadership. We pray for our culture in this country as a whole, God, that you would grant revival, that you would turn back from sin. Lord, though we have had advantages like Israel and Romans, it seems often we are more like Babylon, who loves luxury more than you, who entertains sin more than holiness. And God, we just read in Jeremiah how when you were done with Babylon after exactly 70 years, you judged Babylon. So Lord, we ask for mercy. We ask for repentance. We ask for wiser and more godly leaders. We ask that we not presume upon your kindness. That we would think that it would go forever or that you owe us anything. So God, we praise you for the good things we have, but we ask that you would not help us to take them the wrong way or to abuse them, God, or to assume they were you. So we pray for our country, we pray for our leaders, and we pray for ourselves. Lord, we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing. And thank you, Mr. God, my country, it is
scripture would turn us not to look to our circumstances or to our own hearts or anything in ourselves, but scripture would say, look at the cross. No, God loves you. Look there and think. That's what the song does. Consider the cross. Oh, God's love is deep in you. Let's sing it together.
Oh, Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your grace where you have placed us in this world. Thank you for this church family as we gather together. Dear Lord, we come before you right now to pray for Colin and Sarah Wood. You gave us one commandment to do covenant to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every man and every creature. Dear Lord, we, you have put us where the world comes to us. And Colin Sarah Wood is a large instrument that you are using on the college campus of Western Kentucky. You bring the world to them and they faithfully show them the gospel. Not just words, but they live the gospel in their daily lives, dear Lord. Dear Lord, I want to pray for S. He's a Muslim and is willing to go through Matthew with Colin and being receptive, dear Lord. Soften their heart, open their mind to receive these words, these truths. Dear Lord, Give Colin and Sarah the fruit of the Spirit to where they not feel like they are toiling in bad ground. The Lord show them that you are working on that campus. The Lord let us continue to be an encouragement to them that they will have to know that they have comfort and relief and monetary from us. And the Lord give Calling the servant with wisdom as this epidemic is going on, that they will see clear how to navigate the upcoming semester. That uh, we know in times of trouble that, that you have mighty works going on and bring them to Colin and Sarah so they can have a true understanding and clear gospel with softened hearts that they will change lives and spread the gospel when the students go back to their own countries. Dear Lord, we just praise you and thank you humbly that you are our God creator, that you spoke everything into existence and just know that we love you, Lord, and we submit to you and thank you and praise you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. new song of the month for the month of July it comes from Psalm 32. It's a song of forgiveness. 
It's a great song. I encourage you, even if you learn it this month, to maybe memorize portions of it, or maybe the whole thing. It's a wonderful song. Uh, it was actually just quoted in Romans 4. Blessed is the one whose sin is forgiven, whose transgressions covered. Um, the wonderful thing about this song is that it's one of our heroes of the faith. It's Song of the Day. In one of the darkest times of his life, what he create that he commits great sin. But he is forgiven through faith. Um, so as you sing it this month and learn it, spend some time in it, think about it, maybe memorize portions of it. Uh, we'll sing through it once and then you can join in the next one. Let's go ahead and Jews any better off? No, not at all. 
We have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asp is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness, and their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. In the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law said, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Thank you. You may have your seat. This is the last of our seven sermons on bad news. This is the final verdict of the bad news of the wrath and judgment of God that we all stand under by ourselves. I want you guys to know, as I said before, we are just centimeters away from, I think, the best verses in all of the Bible. In verse 21, you see those first words? But. Bad news, bad news, bad news, bad news. And we're almost there. We're almost to the good news. I love the gospel that's there in 21 to the end of the chapter. I can't wait to get there. And it's my favorite verse in the Bible, I think. It's holy ground. I want to preach with my sandals off. I want to just stay there. We're going to slow down. We're going to be there for weeks because it's so good. It is the good news of the gospel. It is the hope we've been singing about. But that good news is only good if we get how bad the news is here. When we first were married, we had a plan, and we did the honeymoon out west to go to the Rockies, beautiful mountains that God has given us if we're in this country. But the drive between West Kentucky and the foothills of the Rockies is absolutely ugly, flat and boring. But each mile that you drudge through the bread basket through the plains of Kansas and Oklahoma make getting to the foothills of the Rockies so much more worth it. And so today, for the last time, we are there in the valleys, in the plains of our sins, so that when we come to verse 21 next week, we will gasp at the glory of God and the gospel and the righteousness of God revealed and crushing his son to save a people for himself. That is going to be beautiful if you will listen to me this week and you will not skip over or fly over the plains and just say, I can't wait to get to the good news. If you understand the journey, understand how low we are in our sin, how much we deserve the wrath of God, then the gospel that he has offered to give will be so much more glorious. Please feel that this morning. Another reason why this text is important is in the history of the United States, in the history of Christendom, the passage you are hearing this morning was the single set of verses that has caused the greatest revival in our country. Jonathan Edwards, who God used his preaching to bring about the revival and saving of thousands and the turning back of our nation in the 1700s, happened through this text, not the next one. Preaching The sermon that was preached again and again in New England that spread like holy wildfire to save people was called this from our text this morning. The greatest sermon ever preached in our country was called this. 
the justification of God in the damnation of all sinners. Does that sound like a good message to cause revival? Doesn't it? But we need it. He says in his journals that he preached this sermon again and again. Preaching about the bad news in Romans. And people would cry out in the congregation, But sir, is there not any good news? And he would say, come back in a couple of weeks. And he wouldn't even give them the good news of the gospel. Because he, like Paul, wanted us to feel the absolute weight of our sin and what we deserve. When you feel you are helpless, when you feel you can't do nothing, and someone comes and rescues you, you love the rescuer all the more. God who is the just, the damn the sinner, and the justifier to save the same sinner who puts his faith in Christ. Greatest sermon possibly ever preached in our country happened from this. He says even in his journals and in his writings that, that people would cry out in the congregation or weeping going throughout the city for weeks. Not even saying how good God is that he would give us a savior. No, just agreeing with the bad news. How holy and right would God be to damn us right now? God is a good judge. We deserve to die for our sins. We have brought this upon ourselves. They were crying out in holy worship. Not even that God would save sinners. But that God is worthy to be worshipped if all he did was to judge us in our sin. Bad news makes us love the good news all the more. Isn't that what Paul is doing? Turn back to chapter 1 of Romans. Romans 1, 16. He states his thesis. The good news he can't wait to get to. Chapter 1, verse 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as is written, the righteous shall live by faith. That's his thesis. That's where he's wanting to go. That's where I'm wanting to go. That's where Justin, Jonathan Edwards is wanting to take his people. But the first place he went for us was seven straight sermons that taken away every excuse we have for our sin, every accusation we might have against God that he would be unjust, so that finally our mouths would be stopped. And we'd say, we don't deserve this good news. We have sinned, we are guilty, and God would be right to give us his wrath. Look at chapter 1, verse 18. So he begins his evangelism. He begins on the, on the, the road to get us to the mountains, the foothills of the gospel with verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And so from chapter 1, verse 18, all the way to chapter 3, verse 20, guess what his main purpose has been for us? To get us to agree that we, whether Jew or Gentile, are under the righteous wrath of God. It would be right for God to do that. He started off in chapter 1 saying, Gentiles who have never grown up in church, who have never had the Bible, they are without excuse. The glory of God in the heavens, the conscience that he has given them, has let them know that they are guilty. They cannot say we didn't know. And then the religious people, the Pharisees and the Jews, which are much more like us, they had the law, they knew what to do, and what did he say? They still did not keep it. There is none Righteous, no, not one. His purpose to get us to chapter 3, verse 21 has been to lay us low in the dust to know our sin. Friends, as we begin to unpack these verses, if you do not agree with God that you would be right to send you to hell forever, you will never love the gospel. In fact, you do not really know the gospel. You will not really love God in the gospel if you understand the righteous wrath of God. It's been his purpose. Okay, so two goals are going to happen in our text this morning. One is to get everybody to stop talking. You put your hands over your mouth. Look at chapter 3, verse 19. We know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped. My goal this morning, first goal, is to get everyone to stop thinking and talking as though they are righteous. If you're good. So maybe the first point is going to be, you're bad. You on your own are not good. And then the second purpose, so he's going to give us the law, we're going to talk about righteousness, is to get us to stop talking. And the second goal this morning is to get us to stop working. Look at verse 20. 
For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. First goal, stop our mouths from thinking that we are good enough for God to love us, or good enough to have heaven, or good enough to be near him, or that there's something bad in God. Stop that talking. And then once he's got us to stop talking, to get us to stop working, to think that we can change ourselves, that we can do the law now in order to merit his favor. Chapter 3, verse 9. Let's, let's do that. Let's, let's follow Paul's intentions for us. Verse 9. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are under sin. Every single human being born after Adam is this, under sin. By our own choosing, by our own doing, by being from the seed of Adam, we are under sin. And it is a weight of guilt, a power of, of judgment, a, 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 a slave master sin that we cannot escape. No talking to the person who's got you in the headlock is going to let them release you. No fighting back is going to get them to release you. You are under sin. You're totally prey of our own doing. It's in our core, and it comes out in our actions apart from the grace of God. He's saying, I'm telling you Jews, I've been telling you it was the Gentiles, but I'm also telling you, you are under sin. It doesn't matter if you were born in a Christian country. It doesn't matter if you have Christian parents. It doesn't matter if you do certain Christian things. By nature, you, like the Jews and the Greeks, are under sin. Now verse 10. This is very important as we think about, I want my friend who is lost to be saved. I, who am trusting in Christ now, I want to enjoy Christ all the more. Then you need to see where he begins and lays his argument. Verse 10, there's something so special about this. As it is written, we must have the word of God speaking to us and us listening. We will argue and argue and argue with God unless we listen. As it is written. You see, actually, verses 10 through 18 is God speaking to try to get us to stop talking. Friends, when you come to the Bible, you come to argue with God, you come to plead your own righteousness, or do you listen? Listen. Even this morning, you might not like the topic of the sermon, but friends, as it is written, don't listen to me, listen to the text. It is telling us this morning there's no one righteous. God would be just to damn all of us in our own sin. Verse 10, as it is written. And this is not a new writing. This is an old writing. It's always been this way for the Jews. They had the scriptures and they missed it. They kept trying to justify themselves. They kept trying to say, well, we're not, we're not that bad. And he says, as it is written. And are you ready for the main statement that Paul makes? This is a katina, which is a chain of of scripture one after another and here's I think the main thing ready verse 10 none is righteous no not one so I can look out in the crowd this morning and I can know not because I said it or I believe it but because the word says none of you are righteous you're not you're not good you're not good enough on your own before a holy, righteous God. You are not righteous. Don't think for a second, oh no, he's talking about most people. He's not talking about, he clarifies it. None is righteous, just in case you don't know how many none is, that means no, not one. He doesn't get, no one understands. No one seeks for God. None is righteous. Friends, one of the jobs of the church, the saved and redeemed, trusting in Christ by faith alone, is to be a pillar of truth to the world. One of our jobs a truth that we must uphold, no matter what the culture says, the opposite, no matter how unfriendly it seems. We must be a beacon of light that says, mankind is not righteous. When we see racism, when we see abuse of authority, when we see rioting, we can't just say, these are good people, we just need to re-educate them. No, we must start and say, none is righteous. We are evil from our heart. It's not an education problem. It's not a government problem. It's not even a parenting problem at its core. We are under sin. We have chosen sin. We are not righteous. How many of us are righteous? No. 
not one. Now, immediately, remember what's going on here is he's trying to stop our mouths. In your mind, you're already reasoning if you don't listen to God's word and trying to justify yourself. Just, but I know some righteous people. But I do do good. But I'm not that bad. Well, first, you're arguing scripture. It's none is righteous. But the reason why you're probably doing that is because what you can do in your mind right now, in your heart, in our sin, we're comparing ourselves to who? Each other. Well, I don't read my Bible as much as I ought, but I read it more than that person to my left. I don't pray as I ought, but I do pray more than most people. I don't cuss, really hardly ever. I don't cuss as much as this person. You're comparing yourselves to yourselves. That is not the standard that we've been compared to, is it? Look at verse Verse 20, there's a key phrase here. For by works of the law, no human being will justify in whose sight? Look at it with your own eyes. In his sight. It's not, do I look better than this person? Am I cuter than this person? Am I stronger than this person? Do I give more time than this person? It is in God's sight. The comparison is to God. But our sinful core, we're always comparing ourselves to ourselves, aren't we? This is how silly it is. I love running. I want to be fast. And I, I was a pretty good sprinter in basketball, at least in my little country basketball team, uh, the people that were there, and, 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 and got older, and I wanted to run in a 5K, and have a 5K in the medical center 5K, and 10K, more about that later, and I'm going to train, I'm going to train, I'm going to win, who, who runs just for fun, I'm going to run to win, we're always comparing ourselves to ourselves, I want to be the best in bowling, can I tell you an embarrassing story? One of the first years I really trained myself up, trained myself, I'm going to win the 5 I'm going to be the fastest 5K runner in our county in Bowling Green. I got second place. First year, second place, first year. That's pretty good, right? Well, it wouldn't be much to boast about if I told you the rest of the story. I was second place, all right. But what if I told you the person who was first place was a female? What if I told you not only was the person who beat me a female, but she was a 40-year-old female? And I was in my prime in my mid-20s. What if I told you not only did I get second place to a female who was 40 years old, but that she was five months pregnant? <laughs> True story. Oh, it gets better. On that Saturday in September, the first race is a 5K, that's three miles, and then the second race is the super competitive one where the Kenyans come in from out of state to run for money, the 10K, it's six miles. This 40-year-old, five-month pregnant female beat me in the race, crossed the finish line, did not stop to get her milk and her bananas and her trophy, ran to the next starting line of the 10K that was twice as fast, twice as competitive, and ran and won that race. Do you see why I shouldn't go around saying I was second fastest in the land? <laughs> but we do know it because we compare ourselves. I said, well, I beat all the other people. I beat all the other people. In fact, you know why I run the 5K and not the 10K? Because my best time in the 5K, it might get me second or first place, wouldn't even get me in the top 20 in the 10K. But I don't tell anybody that. I pick the race that I know I'm more likely to win. Isn't that how we are in our sin? When we look at God's holy word, we compare ourselves not to him, not to God, but to each other. I'm more fit than that person. I pray more than that person. Friends, if, if we're just comparing ourselves to ourselves, then yes, you are pretty righteous. You're righteous than that person, more righteous than that person, you do more good than that person. But that's not whose sight we will be judged in. You are not righteous, you are not good because the standard is perfection. None is righteous, no, not one, in his sight. You, you see, I'm faster than the average child. The average child that looked up this morning runs about two and three miles an hour. I'm faster than the average male adult, which runs about six miles an hour. That's an average. Now, I'm a pretty good distance from the fastest man on earth, Usain Bolt. He can run 28 miles an hour. But do you know how fast the speed of light is? True speed? You know how fast the like three miles an hour, six miles an hour, twenty, what, one hundred, six hundred and seventy million miles per hour? That's speed. Usain Bolt is not speed. Lucas is not speed. You're not speed. But we compare ourselves to ourselves, don't we? So we can feel good, so we can hand out each other's trophies. The standard in comparison to our speed is six hundred seventy million 
miles per hour. That is God's standard for speed. Let me show you the standard in the scriptures. Turn to Matthew chapter 22, verse 36. What is God's standard for speed? Matthew to the left. What is God's standard for righteousness? You know, God makes it really easy for us. There are many, many commandments. There are lots of parts of the law in the Bible. But Jesus summed it up for us when a self-justifying man like us questioned him. He tells us, what is the standard? What is the miles per hour that God wants us to attain to, to be called righteous? Matthew chapter 22, verse 36. Teacher, one runner, one man asked Jesus, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him this. Are you ready? Compare yourself to this, friend. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. So I'm going to bring out all the law for you. Let's just let's keep it simple. So we've only got 30 minutes more. What is the standard of righteousness? Jesus said it out of his own lips. If you want to be righteous according to your own deeds, your own good, here's the standard. Is it three miles an hour? Is it six miles an hour? Is it 28 miles an hour? What is it? The speed of light. Do you see the gap from that standard you just read to your own life? He doesn't say the son of all commandments is make sure you don't commit adultery because most of you are probably righteous in that compared to each other. Or you shall not murder. I hope you're all pretty righteous in that. But that's not the standard. But the height, the mark is here. You shall love the Lord your God, which is some of your heart, and then reserve the rest of your heart for your high school sweetheart, or the Kentucky basketball team, or the family farm, all of your heart. Well, I'm going to get up in the morning, I'm going to run. All of your strength should be pursuing and loving God. All of your mind, well, I need to say some of the mind for this. I'm really fascinated with these things. I'm going to be expert in these things. All of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, all of your mind. Do you see how far it's not just some? All. That's the commandment. That's the commandment. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. Jesus again reiterates this. And the book, what is the standard? How can we really believe that none is righteous when we see that this is the standard? Not our own, not the Baptist standard, not the best prayer person in Bethany standard, but this is the standard. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. Jesus says, For I tell you, unless your what? Righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So, three mile an hour child, six mile an hour man, 28 mile an hour fastest man, you same goal. If you're going to be righteous before God, your righteousness must not just be one mile an hour than the, the fastest man. It must exceed the most righteous people on earth. The Pharisees described, no one kept the law more than them. Paul says, according to the law, he was considering himself righteous and blameless. And here it is in chapter 5, verse 48. Are you ready? This is why God can look down and say, we are all just to be damned because none is righteous. Chapter 5, 48. You, therefore, must be Perfect. As your heavenly Father is perfect. Feel the weight of that. Don't compare yourselves to one another. Don't compare yourselves to your wife. Don't compare yourselves to your children. Don't compare yourselves to anyone. Perfection is God's holiness. Perfection is His standard of righteousness. Anyone that comes short of perfection, all their heart, all their soul, all their strength, all their mind, Romans chapter 1, verse 18 says, the wrath of God is revealed and rightly falling upon them. Feel the way of God. Please don't compare yourselves to one another. Compare yourselves to God in His holy word. This is how every mouth will be stopped. This is the standard. Let's look at it a little bit more in verse 11. Romans chapter 3, verse 11. It says, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. Oh, but pastor, surely there are people all throughout the country who, are, who, who don't, might not be Christians, but they're seeking after God. Okay, you might think that. That might be what it appears. But according to this, no one is seeking for God the way that he says we ought to seek for him. 
In fact, most of what is called seeking God is not really seeking God, but it's seeking how to do things so that other people will love you. It's seeking God made in your own image, a God that you would like, a God that would self-justify you. It's not seeking God for God's sake. It's not seeking Him with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Now notice in here a correlation. Righteousness, I think, is being described in two ways. Righteousness, by which all of us will be judged, right now and forever, is righteousness according to what we seek, what we desire, and also what we do. Do you see which one came first? God is not going to first judge us for our actions, but for our hearts. But Lord God, our heart, soul, strength, and mind. Verse 12 does with the deeds, as the rest of this katina does. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. That hurts. No one does good, not even one. You will be judged, not just for your actions, but for your heart. And did you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind? I hope you're saying no. I hope you put your hand over your mouth and say, I, I can't say yes. I can't think of anyone. Put my hand over your mouth. But let me show you one more thing that's important about the sex. As you are a born-again Christian, who I think understand, hope you know the gospel, I want you to see the correlation. Verse 12, when your day looks like a day when you have been unkind to your wife, when you have been unfaithful at work, when you have not done all the deeds that you wanted to do, what happened first in your heart? Do you see this? It's a breakdown of your desires, a breakdown of seeking God. When you examine your day, when you say, according to the law, I have not done right, if you'll also examine your heart, according to the law, you see there's been a breakdown there. And this is why I urge you to seek God first in the morning, to set your affections upon Him, to get in the Word, because it affects your day. It affects the way you respond when someone is short with you at work. It affects the way you act when someone cuts you off on the street. The deeds flow from the desires of the heart. See this correlation. So Paul continues in the Katina, unpacking scripture after scripture in the Old Testament of the Psalms of Isaiah, talking about common man. Look at verse 13 and ask yourself, how does your throat compare? Their throat, folks is on the mouth, their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asp is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Your tongue. With your tongue, have you ever even one day loved the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind? Every, every word that is spoken. Not just the hour you were at church when you cleaned it up and you praised because the words were telling you what to pray. All throughout the day. Friends, imagine what the lips of the seraphim and the elders and the angels and the holy living creatures in heaven are singing right now. Endlessly. Every second. Holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy is he who vindicates himself against his enemies. Holy is he who redeems the people for his name. Holy, holy, holy. How do your lips compare to their lips? How does your praise compare with their praise? How does the things you talk about at work, at home, on the school bus compare with what they say? In comparison, our throat is an open grave. The venom of asp is on our, on our tongue. Yeah, see, don't compare yourself. You can think, I have a pretty clean tongue. I don't cuss like my foul language neighbor. On judgment day, you'll not be compared to your neighbor. You'll be compared to the throne of heaven. And this language here ought to invoke a reminder of why we are this way. Look at the way. What is under their lips? Venom. What is asp? A snake. In Adam, because we have chosen sin, we are naturally the seed of the serpent. Apart from the grace of God, we would be hated as much as the serpent himself. The mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Look at verse 15. What about my feet? Are my feet good? Are my mouth out? What about my feet? Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery, the way of peace they have not known. You get this picture of a young man or a person that hears the right path, and they're not even going to go down it very long, they're not even going to pursue it quickly, but they're swift to run to you. It's so natural. It's what we want to do in our natural sin. We choose to sin. Our feet are swift to run to sin. The feet follow the heart. The lips follow the heart. 
swift to shed blood. Does that mean that everybody's killed somebody? No, that's not what he's saying. In comparison to the throne of heaven, their feet are swift to shed blood in the past, so ruin and misery, marriages, trouble, relationships, always needing patching, children reflecting our own sins that we taught them, ruin and misery. And then the eyes, verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. He doesn't just mean they don't ever think about fearing God. He means that the standard is righteousness. With their eyes, they have not loved the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, strength, and mind. Friends, what have you been putting before your eyes this week? Is it the fear of God? Would you watch that on the screen if your eyes are also fearing and looking to the holy God? Before their eyes, with your eyes seeing the kid, the angels in heaven, their eyes focused on the throne, their lips singing his praise, the glory they give to God. So verse 19, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped. If you're still arguing in your heart that you are a good person on your own, there are good people out there, it could be because I'm not good at preaching. But you're arguing with God's word. This is what it says. When Paul writes that no one is righteous, no, not one, he includes David in that. He doesn't mean, well, except for David. He says, no, not one. But what about Abraham? No, except, no, not Abraham. Not Mother Teresa, not any present, not any hero, not any preacher, not anyone in this room. No one is righteous. You cannot name anyone who is righteous. You cannot name yourself. He's saying, stop talking. An application point here for those of you who are in Christ now. And you are saved, and your righteousness is not your own, it is His declared to you. When you sit down to pray, when you pray to God, please in your mouth now, don't start claiming your unrighteousness. Don't say, well, I was unrighteous, but now look at all these good things I did. When you come to God, don't, don't speak in your heart, check your heart. Am I, am, I, am I saying, God, you should listen to me because I evangelized today? You should listen to me because I gave 10% when it was really hard. Don't speak our mouth before Christ and after Christ in regard to unrighteousness. You should always be silent. We don't go from being silent as lost people to saved Christians who now start talking about our own righteousness. We should not praise each other's righteousness. We should not compare ourselves to one another's righteousness. Before and after Christ, stop. Because the standard is speed of light. It is perfection. So that was the main point. Here's the second thing he wants us to do. So that every mouth may be stopped. First thing he wants us to do, every mouth. Hand over mouth. Stop claiming you're good. Stop claiming Mankind is good. And what else? And the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. It seems to be this is the picture. This is the picture we're going to end with without even hearing about the gospel. Hearing the law, understanding what we deserve. One hand would go to mouth, I'm not righteous. And the other one would beckon God's judgment. I deserve it. I deserve it. I deserve it. I did this. I'm guilty. And your standard is perfection. Even after claiming Christ, if it's my own works, hand over mouth, I deserve your judgment. Bring it on. You remember me saying that in John and Evans' day, when the revival broke out for the first couple of weeks, all people were screaming was not that God is good to save us, but God is good to damn us. He would be right to do it. You cannot love Jesus until you agree what you first deserve. Hand over now. I'm accountable to God. I do this. Or another way to put this, the second thing he wants us to do first is to stop talking. The second is to stop working. Okay, so there's a two-part process. It's not one and two. It's one and one A. Because when you realize that you yourself are unrighteous, you don't say, okay, I understand I've done bad, but now I'm going to start doing good. I did not speak well these many years of my life. I'm going to start speaking correctly. I did not work hard in the previous life. Now I'm going to work hard now. You cannot save yourself. You cannot work to earn righteousness when you yourself are unrighteous. How can feet that are swift to run to shed blood all of a sudden turn around and run towards good? They are bent on that. They are under sin. They are under its weight. They cannot escape. Friends, the picture that comes to mind is a little morbid. Is just in Logan County a couple of months ago, a man who was delivering a roll of aluminum 
thousands, thousands of tons probably of aluminum, made one wrong step, and the aluminum rolled off and crushed him. They said it was like something from a cartoon. That is our sin. That is the judgment of God. You cannot push it off. You cannot reform your ways. One wrong step, and we deserve the wrath of God. There's nothing you cannot do. It would be like this. What if I said three miles an hour is average child, six miles an hour, average man, 28 miles an hour, you saying both, and the speed of light is God's standard. Would you leave today and say, all right, I've got to change my diet. I'm going to run the speed of light. I'm going to start working out three a day. If you understand the standard is that, the last thing you would do is change your diet. The last thing you would do is just start running harder, wouldn't you? You would look at the insurmountable righteousness of God and you would say there's no chance. God is right to end this. God is right to damn the sinners. Would you train to run the speed of life? Would you try to improve yourself? Is Christianity just saying, you know, people are a little marred, they're a little broken, we just need to give them new education and they'll improve their ways. Friends, we don't need to just get better. We need to have our guilt removed. We need something to happen that is foreign to us. We cannot just say, we don't run fast enough, we're going to run faster. Something has to happen outside of us. Something else has to happen. The point of the text, the last bad news, is so that everyone put their hand over their mouth. And stop talking about their own goodness. And they also stop working. I'm not going to share the gospel this morning. I want you to feel the weight of that. I want you to go back to the 1700s when the revival broke out. I want you to get back in the book of Romans and know that not only are you damned, not only are we on our own, there's nothing, there's nothing you can do about it. You can't. Chapter 3, verse 21. But. Let's pray. God and the Holy Spirit must make the word reality to us. Help us as we sing those who are trusting in Christ to once again be reminded to lay our sins upon him. We cannot do anything. We do not deserve one but now. If anyone does not know Christ, Lord, would they cry out to you, would they seek you in your word, would they keep reading on in Romans until you give assurance of pardon? There is nothing we can do. We must act must give a gift. You must fulfill the law. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand to you. Yeah.
Before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you, you're in Christ, are all sons of God through faith. For as many as you were baptized, into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. You're dismissed. 